So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Julie Sommerfeld. I'm the manager of rare books and special collections here at the library. The book being discussed today is here on display along with another item. So if you haven't had a chance already, please do make time at the end to come up and take a look. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Yvonne Lowe. Dr. Lowe is a lecturer in Asian art at the University of Sydney. She researches on Southeast Asian art with an interest in Asian diaspora and transnationalism, women's history and digital methods. She's currently an advisory committee member for the Flow of History, the Woman Afesto Way and co-developer of the digital tool Artist Trajectories Map. Today, Dr. Lowe is discussing a 1928 sample book with sumptuous swatches of hand embroidery by Canton textile manufacturer, Wo Sang. This book offers a glimpse into the rich export industry of lush silks and embroidered shawls in the early 20th century. Dr. Lowe invites us to consider the expansive networks of trade between Europe and Asia, where suppliers and manufacturers of silk goods and textiles have played a central role in mediating the production of luxury things bought and sold across the world. Dr. Lowe will discuss the export of fashionable chinoiserie and explore the appeal of the red and pink hues and the large floral motifs, tracing where they may be used in apparel and interior furnishings from China to London. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yvonne Lowe. Uh, thank you so much, Julie. Before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge the Garagal people of the Yaa Nation, upon whose ancestral land I live and work. I pay my respects to all your elder, past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend my thanks to Associate Professor Donna Brett for connecting me to the incredible librarians here at the Rare Books, and especially to Anne Goodfellow, who has been in incredibly supportive as I prepare my talk for today. I must uh, say that you know, I'm actually really grateful uh, for this opportunity to research on this very rare and exquisite and beautiful uh, sampler of embroidered patterns for silk shawls from a Cantonese manufacturer in Canton, which is present-day Guangzhou. Uh, I must also say that I am not a textile historian, I'm an art historian and so my focus has been on women's art and women's exhibitions but I have immense interest in women's material culture and this has been a rare treat. So needless to say I had lots of fun putting this together and I could go on and on but unfortunately time is an unlimited, it's not an unlimited resource, I wish it is. Um, and so today is really just an introduction of sorts in which I hope to situate the production and circulation of the Canton Shores, as they have been called, within the much longer history of export goods from China to the rest of the world, and hopefully offers some insights to the appeal of Xinhua Suri, which is the Western or foreign adaptation of Chinese designs, and how Chinese merchants and manufacturers have themselves been an agent for its making and export. That is to say that Chinese manufacturers were producing Xinhuasuri for export. And Warsang, Warsang is one um, example who is really catering to this foreign market. So this here is uh, this here that I'm holding on to is a silk cocoon that once belonged to my daughter's many pets. Although to call these silk worms her pets is overstating it, but she did have a lot of affection looking after them as, uh, you know, in their fairly short life cycle from worm to silk moth, as they metam metamorphosize into silk moths and leaving these silk cocoons behind. Um, and it is from these silk thread that large bolts of silk cloth and beautiful silk products were produced. Silk, as we know, has long held the title as queen of fabrics, as a sign of both luxury and elegance. In the Chinese and Islamic empires, silk symbolizes political authority, and in much of the modern age across the world, silk has come to be associated with high fashion. 
I am focusing on Canton, where the sampler is from, but it is important to remember that there are multiple centers for silk weaving industries and the manufacture of raw silk and silk goods throughout the centuries, including Persia, London, Spain, just to name a few. And silk, as we know, has been one of the most valued commodities to be traded along the Silk Road from 3,000 years ago, and it continued to be highly valued even as new centers for the silk trade emerged in Europe much later. Chinese silk was, according to historians, the single most important export item to both Japan and Spanish America. And in 1858, it was recorded that in Canton alone, there were 17,000 silk weavers working. This here is an example of the many types of shawls that have been made and exported to the European market, which you can and probably have seen them in museum collections across the world, such as Met or the V&A Museum, or even closer to home. They are sometimes called the Canton shawl or Cantonese shawl, referring to the place of manufacture, but they are designed not for the local market, but for the European market. And so, and this is another one, the incorporation of these, I guess, distinctly Chinese subject matter, like the pagoda and the figures in ropes, are uh, another, I guess, highly decorative and stylized imagery that would appeal to foreigners as Chinese and exotic. And it seems as if that over time, I would say the factories also produce shawls that took on a more European uh, taste or appearance, such as this one here. But the style and execution remains very much in the manner of the Canton shawl. So this is produced by one of the many Canton factories for the European market as an export product. So this one here is quite typical of the Cantonese style, which utilizes what has been commonly described as the voiding method to demarcate the petals, which serves as a kind of an outline. And it is very similar to those that were produced by Wu Sang from the same period. In Chinese, the term is called liu sui lu, which indicates to leave a space between two adjacent units. And then we also have the block shading, stitch, which is another characteristic of the Cantonese style, which helps to layer two colored stitches to create a stylized pattern and to create a, you know, a, to achieve a very decorative outcome that is beautiful for denoting the layers of petals in a flower. So as you can see, the embroiderers are very skillful in their execution. And in many cases, the shawls are in fact double-sided. I couldn't ascertain for sure that this is, but I think if you lift it up and look at it against the light, you can just about make out that the back does look very similar to the front. And so this is, um, but due to time constraints, I won't be covering how it is uh, produced, but I have come across studies that documented the process and it talked about how up to three needlemen at one time would be doing the embroidery uh, in order to achieve that kind of double-sided uh, outcome. We don't really know how many of such samplers have been produced by the manufacturer, but this one here is dated 1928. It's really well preserved. The colors are incredibly striking. And it is written almost entirely in English, which again is revealing of its export and customer base and corroborates with existing records and current studies of Canton Shores as what I call a bond export item. That is to say that it is made for a foreign clientele like the many other kinds of export goods and export art that Canton was producing throughout the 18th, 19th centuries. And it's also quite likely that Wu Sang specializes in the embroidery and production of specific goods, making it just one part of a much larger chain or production chain. 
So it's quite likely, again, I say that, and I'll tell you why I say that, silk shawls were made in factories elsewhere, so from Nanjing, for example, and then sent to manufacturers such as Wosang, specializing in embroidered silk goods in Canton, who will then oversee the design and the production of these embroidery orders. Why I say that? Because I noticed that there were certain um, th that he was only going to take orders for up to three shore sizes. So the shores were in fact predetermined and he was importing it obviously from somewhere. And the sizes that he was offering was 54 inch square, 62 inch square and 64 inch square. So this one here is an example of the largest size that he was offering or the, the factory was offering. And depending on the merchant's order, the shawl can take on very diverse appearances, as we shall see. And here is the fun bit. Um, and I'll show you some examples of um, goods that I have managed to locate in vintage websites, commercial websites and museums that uh, may have been uh, produced by him or, else or someone else. Um, the sampler features a total of 46 hand embroidered pattern samples across a variety of coloured silk fabrics. Most of the sampler designs are in fact of this very large singular flower motif and it is often quite difficult, I tried uh, and I failed, it's difficult to precisely identify the exact flower and I think it's intentional that we are not meant to be able to precisely identify. It's meant to be quite ambiguous, and I'll come back to this issue later. For now, I wish to highlight how it is clearly this flower motif that Wosang is promoting for the show, because it's repeated several times. It's a, one of the main things that you see. And it also suggests to me, therefore, that this flower motif is incredibly popular or trendy or very sellable uh, compared to, say, the animal and figural designs which are included at the end or at the back of the sampler and there are fewer permutations uh, for you to choose just this one, right? So it's like he's almost suggesting that, okay, we have all of these very exciting uh, designs in its various uh, 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 permutations and then we also have this in case you are also interested. Now I have been able to find in museum collections and also on commercial websites that specialize in selling vintage shores. Examples of Canton shore featuring very close representations of the motifs in the sampler. Just to give you an idea of how the um, eventual product might look like. So this is another one that looks pretty similar to me, the bird or an insect. And then the elephant and the antelope for the deer. There are also two distinct characteristics about these featured designs that jumped out at me. One, as I've mentioned before, is this very large flora motif, which looked vaguely familiar, right? I was thinking, what is it? I've seen this somewhere before, where? Okay, and then <laughs> I have, I, I, I realized that these similar motifs um, were in a lot of impressionist painters uh, paintings works uh, such as Henry Matisse and others portraying Spanish women and so a key characteristic of these designs is really the kind of centrality of that one large flower as you can somewhat make out in the background that one large flower with its layers of patterns unfolding out set against a backdrop of foliage and then the second thing that really jumped out at me was the color right it's really bright pink and Red, and I have wondered about it, of how, again, this has been repeated several times throughout the sampler. Instead of showing a variety of colors, we imagine it could be purple, it could be anything else. But you see this same pink and red repeated several times. And so this combination made me wonder if it might be a set design. Um, or that it is certainly the manufacturer's bestseller, again, that it was particularly trendy. And so we want to keep in mind that there are other kinds of Canton shores that are being produced at that time. So this one here, which is a much lighter in palette, so it's more pastel in, 
in, in, in uh, combination and not like this at all. So my initial observations very quickly brought me to these so-called Manila shores depicted in these paintings. Now the name is quite deceptive because Manila shores were not produced in the Philippines. Um, they were in fact popularized in Latin America, in Spain, and um, as some have pointed out also in the Philippines for a period of time. Now the reason why it took on the name Manila Shore was because early Canton made shores which were being traded from Chinese ports were part of the Galleon trade route that departed from Manila in the Philippines which was then a colony of the Spanish Empire. Now there has been some debate however of Manila-based Chinese merchants also involved in the production of these shores with the local community which suggests that there may be some shores that were produced in the Philippines. But research on this is scant and far more common that it was Manila involved in the transshipping rather than the production or exclusive production of these and these are uh, of what are you know, clearly Canton-made shores. And then I've also found a record um, of a Jesuit historian writing in 1663 about um, that these Spanish galleons would bring from Manila great China silks of all kinds, raw and woven, woven in velvets and figured damasks, taffetas and other cloths of every texture, design and colours. Um, and in fact, this painting here, as you can see by the Italian painter, shows the back view of a woman wrapped in this very large Spanish shore. The flower motif is, I think, very similar to what the sampler has featured. The layering of the patterns and also the color scheme of that same pink and bright red. And in fact, this red, the same bright red, is also featured in this painting entitled simply as the Red Shore. And you may have come across this in our own uh, museum here, the Art Gallery of New South Wales. It is a portrait of the artist George Lambert's uh, niece, draped in a bright red manila shore. And the flower in her hair further references the flamenco dancers and the painting on the whole serves to perform her Spanish identity and heritage. So these shores, early shores from China, were received as ex exotic, luxurious items and would likely have depicted motifs that were deemed auspicious or symbolic to the Chinese, such as bamboo, dragons, lotuses, peonies and cranes. But it has been, I think, relatively, um, no one has quite pinpointed that first prototype, so to speak. There has been studies, of course, indicating that the shore um, was based on the Mexican rebozo, which is a kind of a large fringe mantle, or even the Filipino panuelo. Certainly, shores and mantillas were worn by Spanish women before the import of the Canton made shores, but they were all quite distinct in style um, uh, from these Chinese exports. It may be that, and I think that's very likely the case, that Chinese merchants may have adapted um, or modelled after uh, examples that they have come across um, into silk and made it and, and popularised. And as a result, it was just really popular or well received by um, the Spanish community. As export shunamasuri, the shores, like other export art and goods, they signal, in the words of art historian Craig Cluners, a kind of debased exoticism where the incorporation of dragons, bamboos, and pagodas are combined and recombined to emphasize a stereotyped, mysterious East. These exotic shores were apparently incredibly well received and over time were replaced with more familiar Spanish motifs such as roses, carnations and rosemary. And the shore design itself also evolved, right, and changed according to Spanish fashion tastes, such as for instance brighter colours were used, the composition got denser and in some cases the incorporation of fringes to the shores and this one here is an example of yet another design and type of manila shore that is being worn by flamenco dancers. 
Subsequently, Manila shores or Spanish shores were produced both locally in neighboring factories by local artisans and also imported from Chinese factories who have clearly also responded to the trend and taste of the evolving market, making shores that are less Chinese in style or more Spanish or more European in style. And as a a bit of an aside, what was particularly interesting for me and something that I hope to explore further in the future is how the appropriation of the Chinese shore into the common Spanish women's dress combined with the role that costumebrista artists have played in popularizing such portrayals have subsequently contributed to the construction of national and gendered identities. In this instance, the show as art historian Tara Zana D said, and so eloquently puts it, has helped to formula formulate a characteristic vision of authentic Spanish femininity propagated in Spain and abroad despite regional variety in dress and the garment's Asian origins. And it's very likely, I think, that the shows manufactured by Wosang took on elements of these extremely popular and much evolved Manila shores circulating in the European markets. It's also equally plausible, I think, that consumers may have called it Manila style or Manila shore or Manila style shore or Spanish shore or a Canton shore or Cantonese shore. Thinking as a manufacturer would, they'll be very happy to uh, create shows that would meet the demands of the many consumers. Whether it is one who's looking for a more Spanish design or a more Chinese design, they want as many people to buy their shows as possible. And so this brings us back to my initial observation, uh, the one that I made earlier about the very bright colors. Um, and also the ambiguity of the flower type. And you notice here that how it is being labeled throughout the sampler is quite simply as flowers. And so it can come across as a Spanish rose, or it can come across as a Spanish camellia or a Chinese peony. We are reminded, again, by numerous fascinating studies on chinoiserie, indicating that exoticism remains a highly desired quality for European consumers purchasing imported porcelain, silks, and cottons. And so these two objects here are just two examples of chinoiserie that you may have come across in museum collections across the world. One here is the dressing table in the so-called Chinese style with all the kind of lettuce work and images of pagodas. And it's produced by John and William Nanell in London. And then we also have this uh, amazing wallpaper that is a collaboration between merchants in London and Guangzhou, produced in Guangzhou exclusively for London support, uh, export. So there is no um, precedent in Guangzhou for this kind of wallpaper. It is um, a design that is created exclusively for, um, for the foreign market, which makes me wonder about the shore may well have been a collaboration between Chinese merchants and maybe Filipino merchants. I am making this up. I'm just wondering. <laughs> but you know, it is very interesting. So European manufacturers have copied Asian designs, producing silk designs and patterns that were influenced by Asian products all through the 17th, 18th centuries. And these were, in some cases, sent back to the East um, for Eastern artists to copy, meaning to say that the original patterns produced by the Canton manufacturers for export were in fact European designs. Again, I'm not saying that this is the case here with the Canton shore, Manila shore, and there has been multiple explanations for its origins, but the unanimous kind of understanding is that they were not initially produced for the domestic Chinese market, but for a foreign market. So, to quickly conclude, the designs that the sampler here show is yet another example of the industry that has long seen the adaptation and cross-fertilization of styles and designs between the makers and the buyers across cultures and continents, who are, in this case, merchants keen to make a profit reselling these exquisite imported shores. And therefore, you see they're not only these Manila shore-like motifs um, that represents a kind of hybrid Chinese-Spanish features, but also I notice the pattern featuring European embroidery stitching 
and also the more kind of exotic iconography uh, showing Chinese dragons and uh, maidens. And so I think what this sampler demonstrates, at least to me, is that the manufacturer is very versatile in its offering to cater um, to foreign taste and fashion trends. And we want to keep in mind that you know, there are a lot of risks involved if they get the market wrong, for example, and they ordered a design that has gone out of fashion because we want to keep in mind that the duration of the shipping uh, itself is quite long. I have come across studies of a textile historian who examined the supercargo records to understand travel and scale patterns. And so it's really common for a ship to leave London for Canton, return 13 to 14 months later. And so um, this suggests to me that merchants who place their orders with the company would have to wait over a year for it, notwithstanding the time taken to produce them, which depends on the size of the order, the complexity of the order. So um, it seems to me that um, Warsang is very savvy and is covering the masses, and he's absolutely keen to sell as many shores. Um, <laughs> Who, you know, just to, to, to consumers who like to have a Manila shore or a Canton shore. And uh, that's all I have for today. <laughs> Thank you. Please feel free to.